So the other day I was chilling in old Fangak in South Sudan and I thought, man, this Fangak sure is old. I think I'm going to take a vacation to new Fangak. One lengthy review process and 275 USD later, I was kicking back on the 15 minute flight across the river from old Fangak to new Fangak. Now, you might be wondering, what kind of airline is flying a route from this remote farming town in the middle of South Sudan to this other remote farming town in the middle of South Sudan? Well, dear viewer, let me introduce you to the United Nations Humanitarian Air Service, the only airline dedicated to going to all of the places that no other airline wants to go. This airline is actually managed by the World Food Program which is the UN's program for world food, basically. Now, Sam, you might be thinking, I'm an aviation expert and I know that planes aren't food, so what business does this food assistance program have managing a passenger airline for the largest international organization in the world? Well, the answer is a little complicated, but it starts with this place, the Sahel. All you need to know about the Sahel is that this region is basically party central, if by party you mean famine. Back in the 1970s, in the midst of one of these famines, the World Food Program was struggling to deliver aid. Infrastructure on the ground wasn't developed enough, and all of their Grubhub drivers were getting lost. So the WFP organized 30 cargo aircraft from 12 different air forces to fly over the region and drop specially marked bags of food near population centers over the course of three years. The WFP continued to carry out larger and larger aerial operations over the next couple of decades, like Lifeline Sudan, where they had to figure out how to airdrop 1.5 million tons of food into Sudan while somehow convincing both sides of a civil war to not kill them, and they had gotten so good at coordinating aerial logistics that, in 2003, the UN decided to consolidate all of their aviation services under one brand new airline and put the WFP in charge of it. Now, obviously it makes sense that the UN has plenty of cargo and people to move around, but the real question is, why do they need their own airline to do it? You know, Hooters has cargo and people to move around too, but you don't see Hooters air in a local airport. And this is because, basically, the UN only has two other options. The first would be to use military aircraft to move their stuff around, like they did before UNHAS existed. And admittedly, the UN does use government-supplied planes, but only for their peacekeeping operations, like intervening in a civil war or just kind of hanging out while a genocide happens. They tend to draw the line, however, when it comes to their humanitarian operations, like providing a region with food or medical supplies. The UN has to keep these two branches pretty much completely separate, because they need their humanitarian aid workers to be a politically neutral entity, lest they be shot at or cancelled on Twitter. The other option, then, would be to move their humanitarian workers with commercial airlines. But as you can imagine, that doesn't work for a lot of reasons. The main one is that these workers often need to be deployed to dangerous or unstable regions, and the overlap between deadly war zones and places that commercial airlines will fly is virtually zero, with the exception of Newark International Airport. Just as a fairly recent example, let's talk about what happened in Afghanistan last year. After the US military pulled out of the country and the Taliban took power, every commercial airline got together and said, hey, we really don't want the Taliban doing air traffic control for us, and the Taliban said, we also don't want the Taliban doing air traffic control for you, so just go ahead and send flights here. With no international government presence and no commercial flight routes, Afghanistan would have been entirely cut off from aid if not for the UNHAS. Within a week of the takeover, the UN's airline had relocated its planes to Islamabad for repairs, and less than a week after that, they were already resuming flights back into Afghanistan. By February, the map of their routes within the country looked like this, a better public transit network than most American cities have. Now, obviously, UNHAS doesn't operate like any normal airline. For one, you have to have a legitimate reason to take the flight that you're taking, a rule that I know for certain doesn't exist on other airlines. Cough, cough, please go watch our new channel. The UNHAS will typically only book you if you're on some kind of humanitarian mission for the UN or some other charitable NGO. And in case you were wondering, it turns out that being a YouTuber who likes to talk about planes is not a humanitarian mission. The main reason for this restriction is that although they charge money like any other airline, the UNHAS has pretty limited resources. Across the 23 countries they operate in, they only have 75 aircraft, most of which they don't even own. They just charter them from other airlines. Their actual fleet consists of just 28 aircraft, and only two are real big boy airplanes, one Boeing 737 and one Airbus A320. Most of their planes are much smaller, with the bulk of their fleet being made up of Embraer ERJ-145s and de Havilland Canada DHC-8s, plus a couple of helicopters which, honestly, shouldn't even count. Now, this tiny little airline is one of the best practical problem-solving organizations in the world, and if you want to glean a little bit of their skills, you might enjoy the joy of problem-solving on Brilliant. This course dives deep on the fundamentals of problem-solving, teaching you how to recognize patterns and develop proofs with fun, interactive, and straightforward activities. You're not just going to be sitting at your computer for hours reading paragraph after paragraph. Brilliant lets you learn by doing, strengthening your mental skills whenever and wherever you want. 
And hey, if problem solving isn't a problem for you, then you can check out another of their 60 plus courses on everything under the STEM umbrella. Neural networks, quantitative finance, search engines, logic, computational biology, you name it. People who enjoy my channels really seem to love Brilliant, and I think you probably would too. It's a great way to kill some spare time and turn it into something productive. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org slash HAI or click the button on screen, and the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription.